Cash Flow Diary Podcast, episode 479. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast, the podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you are here today because here's the thing. As you are out there building your business, you're out there becoming a bigger, better, badder investor, better business owner, trying to do the things to grow your cash flow, there's something that tends to happen. You actually end up with cash, and you might not know what to do with it. But also, as you're out there building your business, there's another thing that's constantly happening. Change. And that change can occasionally come up, sneak behind you, and rip away from you the very thing that you figured was your competitive advantage, your honest-to-goodness business, and everything suddenly seems to go away. This is what happens when things get disrupted. Now, many of you know that we have collectively have been going under all kinds of disruption and various different things and we need to be paying attention to what is coming next what the future holds well we're going to talk a lot about that today because i believe that there's something out there that we all need to be paying attention to as entrepreneurs that we need to understand and not only understand but understand how we can leverage it how we can use it and make sure that we quote unquote future proof our business if you will and we're going to talk today about the blockchain. Now, I know some of you, you may like, what's that about? How does that matter for my business? Don't worry, we'll get you there. Because I have with me today an expert who will be able to help us all understand it to a, a whole new level. I have with me none other than Don Tapscott. He's the CEO of Tapscott Group and author of 16 books in technology, business, and society. Here's the thing I want you to understand. He literally wrote the book about the blockchain revolution, how, te- how the technology behind Bitcoin is changing money, business, and the world. Now, you may have heard of Bitcoin, but I'm asking you to pay attention because you may not understand its impact, and most importantly, the technology behind it. Because there are things that I think you and I are about to learn that we'll be able to use to help us earn and improve the lives of our customers in the future. Help me welcome Don Tapscott. Don, how you doing? I'm great. Uh, it's uh, great to be here, as it were. <laughs> I appreciate you being able to make the time uh, because that can get, it can get a little busy when you're at the forefront of things. Uh, well, it can, but right now I'm sitting... Um, looking out the window at the lake uh, in my country place north of Toronto. So it's busy, but I have a pretty good environment for my busyness. <laughs> I like it. I like it. So this being the first time that you're here on the show, uh, I tend to ask everybody the same question the first time that they're here, and I need to ask you the same one. Are you ready? Go for it. All right. I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes, you know, Batman, Robin, Wonder Woman, etc. Because I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common. Chief among them, as an entrepreneur, occasionally I can envision myself flying around town, using our products and services, and saving our customers with them. You know, uh, But also like a superhero, there's this moment where an entrepreneur also has a beginning. For example, if we take the case of Spider-Man. There was a time when he was just a kid, going to school get good grades, trying to do his thing, take some photos. And then one day, an intervening event happens. He gets bit by a spider and discovers, I have this superpower. And you know what? I need to go out there and use it. And he gets to choose whether to use it for good or for evil. So 
my question to you is as follows before the the blockchain research institute before your 16 books before yes especially blockchain revolution before all the things that people know you for today even before the ted talk before all of that stuff what we want to know is who is don tapscott well it's a funny thing you should mention superheroes <laughs> Because there was a publication, CryptocurrencyNews.com, that did a thing called Crypto Superheroes Blockchain and their cryptocurrency heroes using their superpowers for good. <laughs> and uh, and I was a superhero I've never heard of called Mr. Fantastic. Okay. And, and uh, he's supposed to be the smartest man on earth, which I am clearly not. But uh, anyway, look at I started out my career many years ago, and I wasn't into technology. I was into uh, changing the world, actually. Um, I was fighting for civil rights and women's rights. And uh, hey, I'll, I'll say it back in the early 70s, I was an organizer against the war in Vietnam. And um, I decided basically that uh, the world is too unequal, it's too unfair, it's too unsustainable, it's too conflicted, and that my life was going to be about ensuring that the smaller world that my kids inherit might actually be a better one. Now, my kids are young adults now, and one of them started a family, and I can't say that I've really achieved that at all, that the world that exists today, to me, is even more problematic than the world that existed when I be, uh, began my career. So I think that I began to conclude that technology was a really big part of attempting to build a better world. And I'm really dating myself here, but I began working in the late 70s at Canada's Bell Labs. And we had a group of a dozen people trying to figure out how computers connected to some emerging vast network Work of networks. Hmm. <laughs> um, it was 20 years before anyone used the word internet. Yeah. Um, but how they might, you know, change the way that organizations function and have an impact on, on entrepreneurship and on the world. And based on that, I wrote my first book in 1981, arguing that computers were going to become a communications tool. And that everybody was going to use a computer. See, in the 70s, the only people who used computers were programmers. Secretaries weren't even using word processing, really, when I got started. So um, that was a pretty radical idea at the time. Everyone pretty much said I was wrong. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the, my mother bought most of the copies of the book, I think. But uh, <laughs> it was like a, one of my famous studies in bad timing over the years. But... Eventually, it did turn out to uh, to be true, and uh, I continue this work today. Got it. Totally understood. Well, it, it's good to know that moms have been reliable from the beginning. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> even when you're you're getting started. So the you're so you're basically saying you were working on the internet or in the theory of the internet before we before what we call it today, which is good. But there's something that you said that I, I kind of want to dig into you. And because I think this is still playing out for you. You said you you weren't into technology. You made a point to to mention that. I'm, I'm curious to know, was there a, like a particular time at which you said, you know what, even though I'm not into technology, that I, I have to become if 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 I'm going to be any part of this changing stuff, I have to learn or become a part of technology. Yeah, there were a couple of seminal things. Uh, one is I did my honors thesis in psychology, actually, in 1970. Mm. And I'd done a survey of about 500 people. Each survey had 100 questions. And I had a calculator. And I was trying to figure out how to analyze this data. And I figured it would take me a year. Mm. And there was, there was no computer at this university. But... Um, they had a ticker tape machine connected to the GE factory where there was a computer. And so I learned how to program in basic and I wrote a, a bunch of statistical routines. And rather than taking a year to analyze the data, I remember it took like 180 seconds. 
And I thought, huh, these computers, they're going to be big. (laughs) (laughs) And then flash forward about five years, I was doing my uh, graduate degree in research methodology, and I took an advanced course on statistics that was all on a computer Hmm. and uh, was self-paced. There were no, there were no lectures in this course. Well, let's face it: the statistics lecture, by definition, is a bust, <laughs> right? <laughs> nobody, nobody. There's no one size fits all for statistics. Everyone in the lecture theater is either bored or they don't get it. Right. But um, I went at my own pace, you know, and I went over things I understood quickly, and uh, and I got an A. You know, I was never good in statistics, but it was a a thing focused on me, and I thought, wow these computers are going to change learning. And so after that, I started getting into this stuff. And eventually I got lucky and I got the job at Bell uh, Northern Research. And that was the beginning of my intersection, really, of technology and and change or disruption, as you used in your introduction. So when it comes down to it, then where was, would you call that that moment where you I guess, you know, like I said, the superhero realizes I've got something special. I've got something unique here, and I need to choose whether or not I'm going to do anything with it. Well, I I really can't compare myself to a superhero. I may be (laughs) vain, but I can't go that far. But I, I did realize that we had something very unique, that I was convinced to my bones that everybody was going to use a computer. Mm. And that they would change the way that we communicate. They would fundamentally change the sort of ar- the architecture of the, the corporation and how we orchestrate capability in society to innovate, to create goods and services, and so on. And people said I was full of crap. Um, you'd laugh. The main reason was um, that... What people said to me was that managers and professionals will never learn to type. <laughs> that's that's why the digital age will never happen. Okay, it's because managers and professionals will never learn to type. I became a typing evangelist. Yeah, forget about all these profundities about social and business change. I was like, hey, typing is fun. You can learn to type, <laughs> Mister Executive, and. Uh, Of course, now executives type with their thumbs. (laughs) Yeah, right, right. (laughs) Typing is like, I Um, often think like from from, from, uh, school, what's the most used skill? And I think it's actually typing uh, because how else do you communicate today? So (laughs) that's actually interesting. But it also shows how when you are dealing with a new concept, the general public, how they might actually respond to it in a in a very we'll say less than encouraging way so th- i think that i think there's a lot of that that's surrounding uh the things that you're talking about now i mean you you the title of the book is blockchain revolution which suggests that there's something that needs to change there's an old way of thinking that's being overthrown in some way shape or form and what I'm assuming you're you're seeing or feeling some of that same. It just probably feels like a, a repeat uh, to you in some cases because there's a lot of people out there who's like, "What is Bitcoin? Do I even need to pay attention to this blockchain thing? Why does it even matter?" Yeah, well, that's uh, you know there've been several of these new paradigms, if you like, mm-hmm. and uh, you may remember I did write the book Paradigm Shift in '92, so I'm allowed to. Eat talk about paradigm shifts i'd prefer if you didn't it's a little overdone but uh, of course the i didn't invent the concept of a paradigm that really came about famous book in the 60s called the structure of scientific revolutions by thomas kuhn i was the first to write a book that that went beyond science and and applied that term to other stuff but um you know what we said back then was that the internet is becoming a communication tool. And to get to blockchain, if you think about it, if I send you a PDF or a PowerPoint or an email, I'm actually not sending you the information. I'm sending you a copy. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Even with a website, I keep the original. So it's been great. We've all had a printing press at our fingertips and it's democratized a lot of information and so on. But when it comes to things that really matter to the people listening to this podcast show, the you know assets, things like money and stocks and bonds and, and our intellectual property, our identities, all that data that makes us up, um, you know, even cultural assets like art or music or a vote. A vote is an asset, something of value that mm. belongs to somebody. When it comes to all that stuff, making a copy is not a good idea. You don't want someone copying your vote or your identity. And if I send you $1,000, it's really important that I don't still have the money. <laughs> okay? So cryptographers have called this the double spend problem for a long time. And the only way that we can handle this problem in our society is through intermediaries, uh, banks, governments, credit card companies, big social media companies. And they perform all of the business and transaction logic of every type of commerce. They identify, you know, who you are. They identify the, the asset. That's a dollar. That's a stock. That's a vote, whatever. Mm -hmm. They um, clear and settle transactions. They keep records. And overall, they've done a pretty good job, but they're growing problems that are getting big. Hmm. I mean, they're all centralized so they can be hacked, and everybody from J.P. Morgan to Home Depot to the CIA found that out the hard way. Hmm. Um, they exclude a couple of billion people from the global economy. They slow things down. I mean, why does it take seven days for money to go from here to the Philippines uh, when an email goes in a second? Um, they cost too much. Why does a a nanny get charged with 17% um, to, um, to send that money hmm. when, when uh, you know, th there's no cross-border email payments, for example. <laughs> so, um, so th th and, and overall, the biggest problem is that they capture our data. You know, we create this data, but they capture it. And we can't use it to plan our lives. We, they're making the money off it, not us. They, we can't monetize it. And our privacy is being undermined. And people who say privacy is dead, you know, get over it. I think that's stupid. Privacy is the foundation of freedom. And we need to get our identities back so that we can manage them responsibly. So what if, what if there were an internet of information? Uh, and also an internet of value, some kind of vast global uh, I don't know, distributed ledger, kind of like a big global spreadsheet that runs on millions of computers. Mm -hmm. And where anything of value from money to stocks to music to intellectual property can be managed, stored, transacted in a secure and private way. Well, that's what blockchain represents. And, and you mentioned Bitcoin, and it kind of started there in 2008. This anonymous person named Satoshi Nakamoto wrote a paper outlining a new form of digital cash called Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And that was a revolutionary thing um, because for the first time ever, people could do transactions peer-to-peer -peer without a big intermediary. And now, when you think about it, the underlying blockchain technology goes way beyond that. It enables us to trust each other. And trust is not achieved by a bank or government or a Facebook or something. It's achieved by cryptography and by collaboration and, and by some clever code. So when you talk about this is a big disruption, this is a big disruption. I mean, <laughs> you know, this is bigger than the Internet of Information. So buckle up. Well, and, and that's exactly why I want to bring this topic to the forefront, because I feel that way uh, about it. And but at the same time, I'm I'm not gifted enough to understand all of its impact and where to be positioning, you know, either my company, my family, <laughs> myself, any of those things. Uh, but, but before we go down that road, one of the things that you said is that is is how the the we'll call it the ledger or blockchain what have you it can kind of take the place of the intermediaries so it makes it sound like to me though that this is just about being more efficient hello there entrepreneur this is jay massey 
I know that if you've ever gone over to the site, cashflowdiary.com, you may have asked yourself, where on earth do you get a domain name from? Especially as you are beginning to build your bigger, better, better business, you need a web presence. You need the email address. You need a way for people to contact you electronically so that you can stop doing the at gmail.com game. Well, the good folks over at GoDaddy have definitely supplied us with every domain that we have ever used. So what I want you to do is I want you to go over to trygodaddy.com forward slash cashflow diary. Again, that's trygodaddy.com forward slash cashflow diary because it's a quick way for you to get set up to capture your domain name the exact way that you want it. They got easy search functions. And most importantly for you is that you'll be up and running today. As I said, once you get started, stay started. Don't let small little obstacles of how to get your own domain name going stop you. So again, go to trygodaddy.com forward slash cash flow diary and let's get back to the rest of the story. Well, it's that, but it's much more than that. Sh- sure, efficient. You know, think about it. We have this weird say, banking system. You tap your card in Starbucks and a bunch of messages go through six or seven or eight companies, each with their own computer systems. And three days later, a clearing and a settlement occurs and somebody gets paid. Well, what if all of that was on some kind of distributed ledger? There would be no three-day settlement period because the payment and the settlement's the same activity. It's just a change in the ledger. There would be no cost for every one of these intermediaries adds cost because there would be no intermediaries. There would be no errors. So efficient? Yeah, that's efficient, going from three days to zero. But it's much bigger than that because this is beginning to change all kinds of roles in society. It's beginning to fundamentally affect all kinds of industries. In theory, everything that banks do could be done by software on the blockchain. Now, that's not going to happen, of course, because the banks are, not, are aware of the danger of disintermediation, disintermediation. But they're also, the smart ones are aware of the opportunity of doing what I called in a book a long time ago, re-intermediation, the creation of new value in the middle. So um, this came about 1994. I wrote the book, The Digital Economy. They say that was the first bestseller about the web and business. And um, I said, sure, if you're in the middle, you can be disintermediated. But the opportunities to create new value in the middle may be bigger than the lost value. So I've talked about bookstores. I said, you know, bookstores are between publishers and readers. They're going to go away. At least the current model is. But maybe there's an opportunity to create some new kind of thing in the middle between readers and publishers that could be even bigger than Barnes & Noble. Well, of course, Amazon's now one of the biggest companies in the world. So, so this is this is the disruption, danger, and the uh, the create new value opportunity that exists in every industry. And that I think that's the part that attracts me to it because as a part of the creative process, something else usually gets destroyed, <laughs> and and the the new thing that can be made has the potential to to be great. So. You, you've mentioned a, a couple of industries, uh, publishing and, and finance, but I, I'm just going to be a little selfish and say, what, well, how do you see something like the blockchain affecting real estate? <clears throat> well, imagine if there's an immutable ledger where anything of value can be transacted, stored, communicated, managed. So there will be new applications. Well, first of all, It'll start with land titles. You know that 70% of the land titles in the developing world are not enforceable? What do you mean? Well, you live in Honduras, and a dictator comes to power, and he he says, I know you got a piece of paper that says you own your, your farm, but the government computer says my friend owns your farm. Or you're in India, 
you know, and you your parents die, you take the will into the local land titles office. Somebody's bribed a clerk there, and you don't own the land. You're paying rent. So Hernando de Soto, the great Latin American economist, says this is more important than being banked. Because if you don't have a valid title to your land, you can't borrow against it, you can't plan for the future, and so on. So there are projects underway to put land titles on a blockchain. And once it's there, nobody can mess with it. Because a blockchain is a it's a highly processed thing. You know, you if you wanted to hack Bitcoin, for example, you'd have to hack each t- block on Bitcoin, which there are millions, not just because each one is connected to the previous one. It's only valid if it references the previous one. You'd have to hack everything that's ever happened, not just on one computer with the highest level of cryptography, but simultaneously across millions of computers all around the world. The way I described it is that It's sort of a process thing, like a chicken McNugget, you know? It'd be like turning a chicken McNugget back into a chicken. (laughs) Now, somebody can do that someday. But for now, that's going to be really tough. Now, I don't know if you saw, but John Oliver on late night uh, TV uh, did a whole show on blockchain. He quoted me uh, saying that. Then he had a lot of fun with it, saying, man, that's a pretty awful idea. That chicken, when it came back from being a chicken McNugget, would be seriously bleeped. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it'd be it'd it'd have PSTD, you know, and it'd be telling stories about what I saw. Baka, baka. My body is whole, but what of my soul? Anyway, it's, it's a funny thing. So, so the point is that no, but no dictator, no you know corrupt clerk in in India. They can mess with that unless they can turn a chicken McNugget back into a chicken. Now, so that's the first thing. You get these transactions on a blockchain. And there are big projects underway to create uh, blockchain uh, real estate platforms Mm. where people can even buy and sell a house directly without an agent. And in many ways, they don't need other things too, a lawyer. And ultimately, they may not even need bank accounts. Because blockchains, you know, have a bank account too. So so that that's just one industry that's a real candidate for, for disruption. Well, it, it's just kind of close to home. That, that is, <laughs> that's why I was asking. Because of, why is that close to home? Are, are you in the real estate? Yes, we we tend to do a significant amount of real estate, real estate transactions or real estate related strategies. And I've often wondered, okay, how does the blockchain come to effect? So in, in essence, it I can hear that it, it would make transactions faster and everybody's going to you know applaud for that because, man, it could take forever sometimes. But at the same time, when you mention, you know, land titles and being able to, I mean, maybe title insurance isn't as necessary or it becomes different or that changes. And the escrow process uh, is also different. I mean, there when you say it and explain it this way, it, it kind of makes sense. But then it now begs the question, or at least the question for me, uh, I've heard of many different, I've heard of Bitcoin, I've heard of Ethereum, I've heard of Ripple, I've heard of uh, Bitcoin Cash, I've heard of all of these names, but it, I don't understand why the need for a difference if it's all one ledger, or is it, or is it not? Well, no, it's going to be all kinds of ledgers. And each of the ones you mentioned has a different function. So Bitcoin is fundamentally a cryptocurrency um, for which there are some use cases. You know, uh, sending money from Toronto to the Philippines, uh, the global diaspora, you do that on a Bitcoin-based platform and it's going to cost 1%, not 12% through Western Union. Um, you know, you're in Venezuela, you can't get money out of the country. Well, there's a role for Bitcoin. But um, we're not all going to be using Bitcoin in the future. What we're going to be using is the U.S. dollar, which will become a cryptocurrency and behave a lot like Bitcoin does. And we'll use the pound and the, the, the digital pound and the digital euro and the digital yen and so on. But currencies are one. But they're one of 
as we describe in the new edition of Blockchain Revolution, they're one of seven types of digital assets. So you've heard of this thing called ICOs, right? Initial, Initial coin, coin offers. offers. Yeah. Yeah. And um, when we wrote the book, $160 million of money was raised that year in ICOs. Didn't even have a name yet. We called it blockchain crowdfunding or crowdfunded IPOs. And the following year, it was, depending on his counting, four to six billion. And this year, it's 12 billion already. So this is becoming real money that's being raised in a totally new way. And these ICOs are typically raising money as an investment in their company. But there's no venture capitalist. There's no investment banker. There's no stock market. There's no stock, actually. What, you're not selling shares in your company. You're selling tokens that represent an equity interest in your company. So this is what we call securities tokens. But then you, you mentioned Ethereum. That one's different again. That's more like the web. You know, if, if Bitcoin was like email, the first big app of the Internet of Information, Ethereum was the first big attempt to create the web, a general purpose platform where you could build any app. Hmm. And the, the, the currency that Ethereum uses is not fundamentally a means of exchange or a store of values. And in fact, the SEC, and it's also not an equity. The SEC has said that Bitcoin, or sorry, Ethereum and Ether is not equity. It doesn't need to be regulated by the SEC. It's not a security. So, and the reason that Ether has a currency is that Ether, uh, Ethereum has a currency, Ether, that Ether helps make the thing work. It's a way of achieving consensus as to what's the truth on the network, and that Ether performs a number of other functions. So this is why we updated the uh, blockchain revolution. And the new edition has 25,000 new words. It's almost a new book explaining <laughs> uh, these ideas and um, explaining that there are, I, I mentioned three. There are actually seven different types of tokens. So if you're a small business or any kind of business, you really need to understand these and what the differences are. And this may provide you with an extraordinary vehicle for doing some amazing things like funding your company or changing your whole business model. Interesting. Okay. So, and, and you're actually beginning to head into where I was going is for the entrepreneurs that are listening, especially the ones that are either beginning a business or even have an established business. Um, what is the, what would be their advantage or what would be the reason behind even exploring this? But it, in your opinion, well, you use the term disruption. Yeah. So rather than me talking about how the old legacy companies, like a bank, gets disrupted, let's talk about the disruptors and what could happen to them. Okay. Uh, people like to talk about Uber and Airbnb, right? The big disruptors. Huh. Well, they, wow. could be el they could be eliminated by, by the software on a blockchain. So how would that work? I don't know. Airbnb, we'll call it B Airbnb, as we did in Blockchain Revolution. It's a um, it's a distributed application running on a blockchain, and you uh, you're going to a new town, San Francisco. You're trying to find a good apartment, one bedroom. Uh, you're going to be there a couple of weeks. You want it to be nice, maybe a nice view. You find this place because it's a ledger, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like a database. You find a good place, five-star rated. And so you say, yes, I'll book it for this period. You show up, you turn the key or enter a code, and um, a partial payment is made as you enter the, the apartment. You're in there, you use some movies, you know, watch some movies, you use the Nespresso machine, that all gets captured. You leave, you turn the door, full payment is made, and then you write a review. It was great, five-star review um, on, on this blockchain software. 
And nobody can mess with that unless you can you know, turn a <laughs> chicken McNugget back into a chicken. So um, all of, everything that Airbnb does, almost everything, could be done on a blockchain. Now, Airbnb is a smart company, which is why they purchased a blockchain company. <laughs> Because um, and I don't have insider information, but my guess is that they're seriously investigating how this technology could help them improve their business. Same is true for Uber. In the book, we called it Super Super Uber. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, which, in essence, says that the, those companies, or even us as entrepreneurs, that they're they're looking ahead to make sure that they they themselves uh, are, are future-proofed or don't get disrupted by something or caught unaware, considering that both of those companies that you mentioned caught com- in other industries completely unaware um, in, in, such a, in such a way. Now, for those that have uh, listened this far, those that are, are following what, you, what you're saying and, and probably want to learn a, a lot more, uh, what's going to be the best way for them to to find out more of, about what you guys got going on and and to dig into this topic on a deeper level? Well, as I mentioned, um, the big bestseller on the topic is Blockchain Revolution, written by me and my son Alex Tapscott, and uh, came out two years ago. But we did this new edition, and um, in the new edition, we talk about all this crypto stuff, crypto assets. Um, we also talk about Uh, The issue of identity, which is really a central issue for any business that has customers, (laughs) as do all of them, Mm -hmm. and for each of us individually, because there's a big opportunity now for us to get our identities and our data back, and that's a transformative thing. Um, And we explore a number of other issues that we think are really important to, uh, to any business. So I'm very proud of that book. It's a great book. There are other things you can do. Um, You set up a daily Google alert on the word blockchain, Mm -hmm. and every day you're going to get a dozen mind-boggling things that are happening. And don't be confused by Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. And the market has been crashing now for several weeks. It's uh, And a lot of people are saying, well, that whole thing was a big bust. It's not. And, uh, you know, there was a... Uh, you know, partial bubble, but there's going to be, it's going to go up again and there's going to be more crashes. It's nothing like the dot-com bubble. Mm. Now, in the dot-com bubble, in a period of a couple of months, there were trillions of dollars of value that vanished. Here we're talking about a couple of hundred billion dollars. So it's a much smaller kind of thing uh, of losses that occurred. And these are people who who got in at the bad time or they didn't understand the different types of digital assets that we write about um, in blockchain revolution. So um, anyway, don't be confused by all of that. The real pony in all of this is this underlying blockchain technology. Another thing you can do is just if you Google my name or Alex Tapscott, you'll come up with some good speeches my TED Talk has been viewed by over 3 million uh, people. And uh, Alex has did a gorgeous talk recently at a conference in Zug. Z-U-G, yes, uh, is how you spell it. And um, it's, it describes all of these crypto assets and what the, what the meaning uh, of all of those is. So, um, and then what else? Um, you know, you need to start at some point just experimenting with the stuff yourself. Go get a digital wallet. Take you two minutes to download one from Coinbase or in blockchain.info and load up some things. Get some Bitcoin on, on your wallet. Go buy something for 10 bucks. And you're going to learn more about, you know, public key cryptography in 10 minutes, then you'll learn if I talk to you all day long. (laughs) So I used to say this back in in the early 90s about the internet, that personal use is a precondition for any kind of comprehension. So I said, you have to use the web with your own fingers on a computer, okay? Your secretary's fingers don't count. 
you got to use your own fingers. And the same thing is true for this technology. Just go download it, check it out, do something with it. And then there are a million events that are underway. Um, this hasn't really been announced yet, but I can pre-announce it. In April, uh, we're going to be holding a big event called Blockchain Revolution Global. It initially will be in Toronto, but we're rolling it out around 10 cities. These will be thousands and thousands of people who are not into crypto investing, who are into thinking about how blockchain changes their business, the way that they compete, and so on. Awesome. So that that's a good way to get started. Do all of that, and you'll be off to the races. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Now, as we wind down here, I've got a final question for you, because I'm curious to hear how you would answer it, especially given your, your background and, and everything that we've talked about. Um, let, let's pretend for a second that, you know, one of the individuals listening, they, they've gotten to this point, they, they've listened this far, they're going, you know what, I, I'm going to, I'm a, I'm a do exactly that. I, I'm going to start, I'm going to finally get my business off the ground, or I'm going to take it to the next level, because I've got to make sure that m my business is ready, that I am ready, my family's ready for everything uh, that Don's talking about right now. And they, they come to that, what I like to call the precipice of decision. You know, like I know, that when we reach those moments of decisions, what ends up happening often is that we have another companion. And that companion comes in the form of a voice. And that voice often reminds us of what we're not, who we're not, or why on earth Bitcoin, blockchain, who cares? What are you thinking? I mean, you're, it doesn't matter. You can just keep doing what you're doing. That Those are the types of things that that voice says. And for some people, they're actually related to that voice. So my question to you is as follows. Let's pretend that they're actually going to follow through. They're going to do exactly what you say. And they're going to do it in the next 24 to 48 hours. What would you suggest that they do? Besides buying the book and watching my yes. TED Talk, yes, um, I would recommend, first of all, that they Google their industry and blockchain. So Google blockchain in real estate. Blockchain in insurance, blockchain in supply chains, and you'll start to see use cases. And that's a good way to get started. Secondly, this is what we do. The Blockchain Research Institute has dozens and dozens of companies who are getting access to 80 projects that are underway about how blockchain transforms business. And so it's, I know it sounds a little self-serving, but Go to blockchainresearchinstitute.org, blockchainresearchinstitute.org, and uh, feast on that for a bit, and then contact us. And we'd love to be that partner to help uh, walk you through this. Excellent. Well, let me be one of the first to say I, I appreciate the, the work that you have done. You've done it for a while in terms of uh, the books that you've authored, the champions or the, the causes you have championed uh, and that you're, you're, you're still out there making it happen in every way, shape or form, making us aware of what's coming next. And uh, definitely appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge, your wisdom and your insight here with us today at the Cashflow Diary. Well, thanks uh, to you, too. You know, Alex and I get asked a lot, what's going to happen? Where's all this going to go? And, you know, we're of the view that the future is not something to be predicted. It's really something to be achieved. And anyone can achieve a very different future for their business. All they got to do is show some curiosity. You know, I walk into a, a mahogany row in a company or something like that. I can tell in 60 seconds whether or not this is a culture of curiosity or it's a culture of tradition and hierarchy and so on. And so be curious, check stuff out, uh, do the kinds of things that I've been talking about. And who knows, uh, you know, maybe this digital economy will be uh, a time when the, the promise of all this is actually fulfilled. Well, again, like I said, I appreciate you sharing all of that and being the one. You, you guys are out there clearly on the forefront. That's why we're asking you the question. But I did. I appreciate you taking the time to, to, to let us know that it's out there, sir. Okay. My pleasure.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. <laughs> what does that mean? You've got a lot of choices today. I mean, you can obviously Google blockchain in your industry. You, you've got a book to go obtain, Blockchain Revolution. You've got a lot of studying to do, but a lot of curiosity to to peak and fulfill an interest to to go understand. Here's the thing. I know one thing for sure, that at the end of the day, that uh, chicken McNugget was never a chicken. But at the <laughs> so now it's time to go out there and make something else happen. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been fun talking to you today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time.